evening and welcome to the Wednesday, September 29th, 2021 meeting of the Chappaqua Central School District Board of Education. It is now 7.50. Uh, the board has been in executive session since 6.45. Um, can I have a motion to reconvene the public meeting? So, I'll second. All in favor, please stand. Uh, please stand for the pledge of allegiance. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the President's Report, and I'd like to begin this evening by welcoming a special guest. Hi, Biscuit. Biscuit, do you want to come up here? Exactly. <laughs> All right, so Biscuit, right, Biscuit. Hello, Biscuit. Biscuit's here to remind everyone that the Chappaqua Children's Book Festival is this Saturday. It's an absolutely wonderful free event that this year is being held at the Chappaqua train station. If you're familiar with the festival, you're already excited, and if you've never been, you should come. It's amazing. You get to meet authors and illustrators, there's fun and games, and Biscuit. So, given that the retailers have already warned us that nothing will be in stock for the holidays, you can take care of that as well. So, just one heads up, even though this is an outdoor event due to the potential for crowds in close proximity, masks are required. So, be like Biscuit, put on your mask, and come to the festival on Saturday. Thank you, Biscuit. <laughs> but, before the book festival, Friday is homecoming at Greeley. Um, the sports boosters have organized what looks like a ton of fun, food, and activities for all ages before the big football game. Plus, you can come all afternoon and watch our student athletes compete across a variety of sports. So we're really looking forward to it. It's definitely now football weather, so bring a sweater and you're really good. Um, elementary open houses, as well as really open houses, were held last week, and the middle school open houses are this week. All are virtual. Hopefully, by next year, we can be back in the buildings. But it's always great to meet the teachers and see the classrooms, even if we didn't get the full experience of sitting in the tiny kids. And I wanted to also update the community on a project that the board has been working on. So we have been for some time as a board been discussing whether revisions were warranted to our board questions, our strategic questions. These questions guide our work as a board to ensure that when we make decisions, they are mission aligned and furthering the work we believe to be important to the district and moving in the direction we believe, we believe will best serve our students and our community, both today and in the future. So we attended a board retreat September 20th and 21st where we worked on revising our board questions and determined that a revision was insufficient and ultimately we needed to move from having two guiding questions to three. I will share a draft language in a moment, but wanted to first say a word about board retreats. Board retreats are built into the structure of board operations to allow the board time to work on internal governance as well as strategic planning. To borrow from an excellent essay by Lisa Davis, who is the former executive director of the Westchester Public School Boards Association, boards hold retreats to better understand and address school district needs and develop a strong governance team. Board of Education service, like any other professional position, is best accomplished with ongoing professional development and in-depth learning. Board members need to be knowledgeable and current on topics such as school district governance, board and superintendent roles, public education issues, policy development, education standards, curriculum, evaluation, school safety, negotiations, and state and federal legislation, and more. So retreats are set aside from the open meeting law precisely so we can work on governance issues as a board. And holding an annual retreat allows us to set aside time as our professional development to work on and learn about these issues so we can best serve the community. So now what I'd like to do is share the working draft of our, uh, our board questions, which are still a work in progress, but reflect what we believe should be our guiding principles as we make decisions for the district. I will read these aloud, my eyes hold, um, as I know it can be hard sometimes to see at home and, and many of you are following along at home. 
And we will be scheduling a work session or time in future board meetings to discuss them and consider any feedback, continue revisions, and hopefully adopt new versions. So if you have any feedback, please email the board or come to the work session or board meeting when we schedule that. So our first strategic question is around budget and operations. And this one so far has been left intact, which is how can the district ensure continuing excellence in academic and extracurricular programs while developing a budget that is fiscally responsible? Our second question, which we anticipate working with a little bit, but currently stands as addressing teaching and learning, how can the district ensure that all students think deeply, support their thinking, apply problem-solving skills, and actively participate in their learning as they apply our content knowledge? And then the third question that we were working on as part of our retreat, that's currently in draft form, is how can the district develop students who are ethical, empathetic, respectful, and resilient global citizens and leaders? So I think that gives you a feeling for sort of where our thinking is and, and what, like what we're working towards. And again, we welcome community feedback. So turning now, you'll note that under the President's report on the agenda, there's also an update on the proposed form-based code. Um, we want to just keep the community apprised of our actions relating to the proposed adoption of the FTEIS and zoning legislation. As many of you know, the responses to the comments and questions submitted to the DGEIS have been coming in piecemeal. The sections responsive to our questions and comments were among the last sections to be released, dropping to the public on September 17th. By letter dated September 18th, we, through our lawyer, asked the town board to delay the vote date to adopt the FTEIS as complete, which is currently scheduled for tomorrow, to give us more time to read through the hundreds of pages of responses and thoughtfully analyze them. Our request for more time was denied. Over the past 12 days, we have read through the consultant's answers to chapters 2H and 2I. This is not light reading. And wanted to make sure that as an interested agency and as fiduciaries of the school district, we submitted a comment in advance of the vote addressing any issues that still existed for us after reading the comments and changes addressed in the responses. As many of you know, when we commented on the DGIS, the board raised a host of potential concerns. Given the time pressure, we have focused our comments submitted in advance of tomorrow's vote on the two most salient issues. Our lawyer's letter to the town board addressing our concerns has been posted to our website where the other communications regarding the FTC have been posted. But briefly, our two concerns are that first, the FTEIS contains no actual analysis of the impact to school budgets, taxes, or displacement that may result from the proposed action, and that the FTEIS lacks thresholds and mitigation related to potential adverse impacts on the school district. Each of these is expanded upon in much detail in our letter, which, as I said, is posted and was submitted to the town board this morning. I want to sincerely thank our attorney, Adam Starlow, for working with us to make sure we could submit our comment in a timely fashion, despite the short timetable. And that, for anyone still with me, concludes my president's report. Can we say something? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we're a school district and keeping our schools open and safe with the pandemic going on is our top priority. It was almost a year to the day that I brought up the issue of the FBC at a school board meeting. Vicki and I spoke about it. We were chastised on social media about our comments. We're not against development by any means as a school district. We, we encourage development. We, 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 we like progressiveness. We, we think we should be, be moving forward. However, we have to do that, you know, with, with thought. You know, I personally reached out to a town board member earlier this week to ask that they advocate for the school district to provide us additional time to respond to the answers that the consultants pro provided through the questions. I know Adam, has, as all, our attorney, has also done that. I was told, no, that we've had the time, so I guess we get what minimal time the majority of the town board has decided to provide us. We're all part of this community. We should work together for the community. That includes the school, the town, all the other interested agencies. You know, I'm, for, I'm, for, I'm forever the optimist, and I hope that the town board majority will consider allowing or reconsider allowing the school district to, to have additional time to respond. But because, again, our job is to educate our, our students in the community. So thank you, Hillary. I just wanted to let the board know that I tried a different, ven a different avenue, and that didn't seem to go anywhere either. 
Um, I'd, like, I'd like to say something to uh, just to add something different to everything that's been said. Um, I heard last night, I, I did attend a town board meeting last night, and I heard um, uh, a different perspective on the FGEIS that I don't think we, we heard before. And um, it was a perspective that even if the FGEIS is incomplete, that the town board can still use it to make informed decisions on how to move forward. And, you know, while I, I do appreciate the desire to be as informed as possible, and more information is always helpful, but um, I just want to say that it's really important as we work together to share our perspectives. And so what I would say about that is that the FGEIS is really not for uh, research purposes. It's actually a legal document with a very specific purpose, and, and that person, purpose is to declare that there are no adverse impacts. And what it does is it's declaring under New York law that the entire 72 acres can be subject to the form-based code. So it's much more than informational. It is setting a precedent. So, you know, I, I just think that it's important that as we work together, we're on the same page to understand why we're asking for more time, why this is so important to us. And that's because it's much more than, than a research document. We're setting, well, the town is setting precedent. And when you set precedent, you have to know that it's for people who may be in, in these positions that are very much unlike you, that might have much different um, agendas and opinions. So. You know, this is by way of um, emphasizing the point that we think it's very important to take the time and the school district will be, um, that is the interested agency that will have the most impacts and will affect the taxpayers uh, the most. So in setting a precedent, uh, I think it's important to understand what, what the document really is doing. Technical issues before. Um, I, I would also like to comment and say that, uh, it, you know, I think it's interesting that we, we haven't done our retreat to be talking about strategic questions and, and what's what's critical in terms of what the knowledge that, that we want all of our students to graduate from here with, what our focus should be as a board and as a school district. Um, we are not um, accustomed to commenting on zoning re the legislation. That's really not our area of uh, focus, and 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 shouldn't be, except to the extent that it affects our school district. Um, that is why we are an interested party, and I just think it's very important as this moves forward that again to reiterate to the community that that is we are here to represent the interest of the school district to talk about how it can be impacted. That's what this whole study is about. Um, and I want to be clear again, as we've said over and over again, we are not for or against a form-based code, this form-based code. We are, we are trying to let the community know what our concerns are, what mitigation factors have to be involved in here so that we can continue to educate our students in the way that we wish to continue educating them and with the high caliber that people have come to expect from this school district. And the thing that, that it has been frustrating as much as we, we are both, you know, parties in this town and, and people that should be working together, it has been very difficult not to really, we feel, have the appropriate amount of time to respond to what's, what's going on and also to feel as though our interests are not being adequately responded to in terms of making sure that no matter what plan gets passed by the town board, that they can ensure that our educational system remains intact. So uh, it's very important for us to, to try and maintain these relationships. But as our letter shows, we just feel that there are major deficiencies with what's happening right now that are not addressing what could potentially happen with the school district. And we're just trying to shed light on that and get answers. So that's all I have. And another thing I, that I do want to mention, because I received this question more than once, you know, over the last few months, and the question is, 
Well, how many students do you think the school district, how many additional students do you think the school district can take? And what I've always said and what I know um, everyone else agrees with is that we will never place a number on the number of students that the school district would accept. We will accept all students that come through our doors and who live here. And we will accept them gladly with open arms and open hearts. The question is really for the community um, to let their elected representatives know what is the amount of increased taxation that they can bear uh, with regard to the quality of education that they want the children of the school district to have. And that's always been, um, you know, school, public schools have always been subject to local control. And it's up to the local communities to decide uh, what kind of education they want for their kids. So it's really a question for the community. It's not really a question for us. Uh, and, you know, we will never say that we'll accept only X number of kids. First of all, we can't do that. And secondly, we don't want to do that. It's a question of having the right information um, for us to plan, first of all, and secondly, for the, for the community to make informed decisions. All right, thank you. So we're going to move into the superintendent's report, and then we will have our data performance uh, presentation by Dr. Peace, and then we will move into our audit. As David's preparing to set this up, I'd like to recognize we have a lot of people in the audience today. Hello to our students in the back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We typically only have one to six people in the audience. <laughs> so this is exciting for us. And so uh, this is the part where I highlight some of our uh, COVID information and some um, pieces of the agenda for the school board and the community. So um, let me provide some updated information. So we've been sharing our vaccination numbers now. I'm just going to focus basically on the students. And you'll see we're at 92% vaccinated at Greeley, and we are holding steady at the middle schools, but um, it's my hope that within the next two months I'll be able to add the three elementary schools and we'll start to see increases in our middle level program and vaccination program, but this is where we are right now, so 86% of the students at Bell or eligible are vaccinated and 89% at Seven Bridges. And why this is important is because if you are exposed to COVID, um, I'm able to go into the system, verify you're vaccinated, and then you do not have to quarantine. So that is certainly a benefit of being vaccinated. And so we also would like to share with you, um, this past Monday, we did our first round of testing on the part of the weekly. And these are the numbers of um, staff and students who were tested by um, the district's nursing staff on campus. Most of the people who were tested were required to, as you know, we are also required to offer testing to all unvaccinated students in the district K-12 and our vaccinated staff. We didn't have any um, families take advantage of testing who were not required to do so. We have very few vaccinated staff who were tested, but we had quite a number of unvaccinated staff who were required to test up with us. And then we had a small amount who chose pathway two, which was uh, having a private test done on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and submitting those results to the district as a part of uh, the requirements to meet the New York State Department of Health Guidance. I'd like to thank Adam, uh, Josh Block, and David Lees for really helping facilitate the testing for the district. And of course, our nursing staff, and then we had other support staff there, um, of Adam's professional development team. Facilitating this for us. This is a larger scale testing than we usually do, but we were able to handle it effectively. And as more parents want to bring their kids in to get tested who are unvaccinated, we welcome them to do so. And I do believe that this is a better option for us than um, entering into the pool test that other schools did in Westchester County that was connected to the Westchester Department of Health. So we were able to open testing up based on uh, the our numbers and the available tests to all students every week or other places to have a percentage that they'll be offering testing to based on their partnership with the Western Health. So I still, I still stand by this decision. Do you think anybody found it annoying enough that they'll get vaccinated? 
We have a number of people who are who have been vaccinated and will only be testing with us for two weeks because they have to wait for the 14 days. And, and then we have a, a, another pocket of people who will be testing with us for a few additional weeks but have gone and received the first shot. Yeah. So, that is true. Uh, okay, so if, uh, this is our COVID number, or quarantine number from the last presentation that we had here. We had exposure on the, on, a, on, a, in a, on transportation in two buildings, and um, it was at the elementary and middle level, so we had a number of students who were not, were not eligible to be vaccinated who had to access remote instruction. And here we are, this is where this week we had a pocket where no one was um, home learning remotely, and then we just had another exposure at Bell School, which was required a number of students who um, were not eligible to receive vaccination, have to, uh, have to access remote instruction. Again, in this scenario, our exposure is occurring on the bus. And so until we have the ability for our middle and elementary students to be vaccinated, this is typically where our exposure will occur and students will have to access instruction remotely. Um, okay, so now we're going we're gonna to move over to Dr. Keith, who's going to talk about the grants on the agenda tonight. Sure. Do we get any, I mean, I think it's probably too early to know, but even with the bus exposure, are we hearing about anybody else actually testing positive? Yeah, so that's a great question. I would say over the past 15 months, we haven't really had any scenarios where there was spread on a bus or a bus. Because I know that in, in other places they are starting to appeal to the states to, to drop the quarantine rules when kids are fully masked. Do you think that's something that we can test? We got a new health director today, so do you think this is something? So, so yeah, that's a, so we're following Westchester Department of Health's guidance. We were following CDC guidelines, and we've been in meetings with the county talking about if not. Um, adjusting or eliminating the quarantine process for the bus, at least adjusting down the briefing so less students would be impacted. But as of right now, they haven't made any shifts. But if they do, we will immediately follow it. So you see, uh, one, you a gift on the agenda and then an adjustment to a gift. The first gift that you'll find is from the Newcastle United for Youth. It's a grant for $5,500 um, for practice mannequins and some technology related to CPR training. So um, we're going to provide CPR training with the assistance of this grant to all of our ninth graders as part of the physical education program. That's not part of the program currently, but I think that's a nice add and, and those students will be equipped to to assist with someone in distress with uh, the new CPR skills. And the CPR training, as you can see, has come a long way where the mannequins will communicate to the iPad and the apps and actually like track compressions and things like that. So it's become kind of a high tech endeavor. So we thank the Newcastle United for Youth for that gift. And then you'll see an adjustment. I presented this for this grant a couple of months ago. Um, but when we got the final, the final cost, it was um, it had increased a little bit. So the CSF, um, our friends at the CSF were, were generous to make that adjustment for us, and, and so they increased that number from 1,200 to 1,900, and you'll see that on your agenda as 5.5. So thanks for Newcastle United for Youth and also our friends at CSF for this generous donation. Okay, so the last thing I, I wanted to um, speak about publicly tonight, I'm actually going to defer to uh, Andrew Lennon, our assistant superintendent for business. We're dealing with some water damage. It's really based on uh, Hurricane Ida, so I wanted to explain uh, what the next steps are in remediating the damage that, that we have uh, experienced in the high school uh, junior. So. Thank you, Dr. Superintendent. So, uh, you as you can see on the screen here, uh, we, we've already uh, begun the replacement of the water before, and unfortunately, it, it appears as though uh, we may have additional damage. We are um, thankfully covered through our insurer, NYSA, for foot uh, damage related to that. Um, we anticipate that the gym that you see on the screen will be fully restored and adapted to the playable use um, in about three weeks, barring any unforeseen delay. We do still see some moisture in that space, so until that's fully mitigated, um, we can't start putting the new floor in. Um, the main gym floor uh, will take about four weeks for us to 
remove and replace. Uh, also relocate the, uh, the bleachers to get that installed fully. Um, so we will be putting that in. Uh, it's our intention to have that all done uh, well in advance of, of the basketball season starting. So we'll be monitoring that very closely. The um, yoga space and the fitness center are also areas of concern for us because they are hard to floor underneath the rubber mats that we have in the fitness center and elsewhere. So uh, Mr. Grimondo and the maintenance staff have already um, done some mitigation steps that we hope will prevent us from needing to tear up those spaces. Um, but we are applying very closely. And again, I, I will highlight this. This is all going to be covered by our insurance provider. Um, that and I spoke so briefly about potential other sources of income. Uh, Covered from that, particularly FEMA or other sources, typically because you're insured, um, insurance is defined. So we will have a, a small deductible, uh, and then that will cover we will have a nice new floor and a reasonable space. Our goal is to rip, rip the floors up as soon as possible. I know that sounds bizarre, but you know, we have um, winter coming. Uh, we, have to, we need to hold PE classes. We need to support our indoor athletic programs. So um, our, we'd like to uh, hopefully begin work on that on our large gym next week. And so we'll keep you updated, and we'll probably have to at some point send something out to the community. Uh, but we'll be able to manage this right now because we're able to be outside. But pretty soon we'll, that will be the case. So we need to work very, very quickly. Um, the other piece of this is we are, so the green building on the back, you, I just wanted to just confirm that this hasn't caused any interruption in, in classes. Oh, no, I think, no, no, we're okay, because we're, okay. we're outside. But um, the, the problem is, is the creek in the back of uh, by the gym. So Andrew's looking at whether or not we need to have a specialist come in and share with us a remediation plan. However, it's complicated because that's the DP property and, I mean, it's watershed. And so remediating that might, the cost may not be, not be um, aligned with the repair associated if it overflows again. So we'll be talking about that to you at a future meeting. Because we, the district, before we arrived, had, um, had looked at remediating that creek area and the complications associated with doing it because of the way where the creek is and um, the type of property that it's on is it's, it's pretty complicated. But we, we need to examine that again, obviously, based on what's just happened here. So um, that is the end of our superintendent's report. So now we're going to transition over to Dr. Peace, who will present the annual assessment. As David switches us over, I can get started by sharing that typically as a part of this report, I share with you um, New York State assessment results for grades like that elementary, middle school, ELA, and math assessments as well as science. Um, those reports continue to be embargoed, so we have um, that data that's been released to the school district, but at this point we are prohibited um, by the state education department from reporting any of those results publicly. So those, those are still embargoed until New York State releases that information. But I do have some other data that I typically share this time of year. So we will share that New York State data when we can at a future meeting. Um, at this point, we'll go through some of the other data. We have some AP results, recent results, math scores, and things like that. So we'll do this kind of in two pieces, and I'll share the um, New York State data at a future meeting. So just in terms of the organization of the report, um, Typically, we would include the 3 through 8 testing program. As I said, it's embargoed at this point. Um, I am going to share some math scores with you just as, a, as an overview, um, regents exam scores and advanced placement scores. Um, with regard to math scores, first, it's, um, we had implemented math just a couple of years ago. And it's, it's, it was good timing in that it was pre-pandemic. And it really provided some nice data that presented how math works um, to the board in the past. But basically, it gives us a, what they call a written score for each student it track student growth over time. And so you can see on this graph, what we're really looking for is the, the cohort that, that you're looking for. You can look at the grade one cohort, two cohort, three cohort, et cetera. Those are the grades on the bottom. And you can see how they score in the fall, the winter, and then the spring. And what we're looking for is that growth over time. I mean, you have to have a little bit of caution here that not, not to compare one cohort to the next. 
So that jumped from, for example, from first grade to second grade. That's a different group of students. So um, cohorts have you know, kind of relative strengths in their data. So when, you're, when you are comparing the bars, you're really comparing the blue to the red to the orange is one cohort growth over the course of the year. And then we can watch that cohort over time. For example, next year, we can kind of watch that same cohort into the next year. But you can't really jump from like first grade to second grade. But this gives you an overall sense of how the districts are, how the um, district students are growing um, over time with ELA here. And so it's a nice graph. And then um, similarly, a really nice um, growth graph for math. And you can see that consistent growth for the grade levels and also through the cohorts. Um, so this is kind of an early warning system that we use to identify any potential problems. And also um, gives us data on our relative strength and areas that we may need to focus with regard to curriculum. So we can look at you know, and identify the areas that students are scoring really well and other areas where they're not scoring as well. And so we can look at not only student interventions, but also um, curricular areas that we may need to develop. So overall, the, the math scores look really good. Um, regions exam scores, just as a reminder, um, last year, New York State made the decision to only administer the regions exams that were federally required. So typically, we would talk about like, quite a few results. In this case, we're really looking at just algebra and English and then English and living environment from June 2021. The others were canceled. Um, and you'll also remember that we had shared um, that students had more flexibility with regard to their transcript. And the state um, said that students were not required to take the exam past that, um, passing the five required regions of graduation, um, but the state gave us some, some latitude to say if a student was in a course that typically terminates in a regions exam, and the student passes the course, and they don't need to take the exam, so they can opt out of the exam. So the number of students that took these exams is, is, was much less than had you know, typically taken them in the past. Um, you can see our English regions results. This is, this is really challenging to compare. I, even, I, I had some hesitation to even put them on the same chart because it's different groups of kids, there was only, you know, I have the number I could look it up, there were less than 100 students in 2021 that took that English exam, so um, it's comparing that smaller group with like much larger groups in years past, but just to give you a, a sense of how the students did that opted to take it last year, you can see the overall average score was a 92. Um, I did break it down, but the, just as a reminder, the, the regions exams were all canceled in 2020, and that's why we don't have a bar there, uh, but 2021, you can see how that distribution um, was distributed across the scoring brackets. And again, just you know, look at this data with some caution because it's, it's not a whole group of students. It's just kind of the students that opted in. So it's tricky to compare. I think that we can um, safely from year to year in terms of the measure of the strength of weakness of our program. Um, this was the algebra regions. You see the overall average score there. Again, in 2020, the regions exam was canceled. Um, there was, you know, you remember that there was an adjustment for last year where all of our eighth grade students for the first time took the algebra regions. So that was the, the, those students are included here. And then we had a number of students that also took the algebra regions that, that really, that weren't part of that kind of acceleration for all programs we create. And then I, I broke that down just a little bit here so you can see the middle school students had, a, had an average score of an 85 um, for the regions exam. So we thought that was a pretty strong show. And compared to previous years, you see it's a little bit higher, but those were um, some accelerated students in eighth grade, and then some students that didn't accelerate in eighth grade that took that region to stand in ninth grade. So this data is the, all of the students in eighth grade, and I pulled out the students that took it that were part of the really just to give you a sense of how our middle school students scored. And then you can see the algebra um, regions distribution across the different grade level bands. And we did see a drop in that 85 to 100. It, it, last year was such a different year for our students. Some were learning in colloquial like or remote. Other students were quarantined for periods of time. The academic periods were shortened, and obviously the program changed. So it's, it's really hard to tease out which factors um, push the data one way or the other. So, but that, that, those are the data that we have for the algebra region exam bands. Sorry, can I stop you? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Is it fair to say that the eighth grade last year as a whole, the exam scores were kind of I think it's fair to say that the eighth grade as an overall class did better than the ninth graders had done previously. Um, but it's like you're, you're comparing kind of the whole grade level, so there's a group that would have previously been accelerated and, and others that may not have. Um, I, would so that's go, oh, sorry, sorry. I would go further to say that the decision to have all students in eighth grade 
take out the growth with the right one. They did not know to perform on that assessment. And it opened up a lot of um, different options for ninth grade for a grade students. And I am, I am um, certainly pleased with our decision to continue that model moving forward. And I would anticipate that these scores may look different now that students are on site in algebra every day in both of those schools. So this next chart, you can see that, again, in 1920, we don't have any scores. And then, because most of the region's exams were canceled, you can see that enemies across the right side do, do have scores for English, which you saw before. And then it broke out by course, what the grades were. The number of students taking exams in some of these courses were very small, especially the Greeley courses. So it was just you know, a, couple of, a couple of students, in some cases, handful less than 10 in some cases. Uh, so again, it's hard to compare last year, previous year, because of that. Then I do have some advanced placement exam data um, to share. So you can see in, in this graph the number of students um, that took exams and scored in each of the grade bands from 1 through 5. Um, there were fewer students last year that took the AP exam overall. You can see kind of the, the bend of that curve is similar. There's just uh, far fewer students there. It, it's interesting. We've been hearing increasingly hearing from colleges that they're considering AP scores less or not at all. Um, so I wonder if that factored in in addition to the pandemic. So um, you can see a, a pretty significant drop in terms of the number of AP scores, or AP exams. And I, I just want to add, because I'm not sure I'm going to, uh, so let me just clarify for the board. Students are required to take the AP exams if they're enrolled in the class. Last year we made it optional based on our experience the previous year with AP um, for our students, and, and that was at the recommendation of the high school team because it was extraordinarily stressful. So um, it's interesting to look at the data based on who chose to take the assessments when we didn't make them required as a part of the course. And to, to add to that, we were also recently, just this, this week we were in a, um, a, a meeting with our school counseling team with an admissions officer from a very, very you know, difficult, a highly competitive college. Um, and they said that uh, they still look for students to take AP courses. They, they see them as, as a real challenge. Um, and they understand that level of challenge, but they, they said that the score is not here. You know, for this particular college that you're speaking to, they said the score is not nearly as important. In fact, the students didn't even have to report the score um, on the AP exam. So I think we're going to see a trend in that direction. Um, we've already been seeing it. I think we'll see it increase. Um, I, I do want to mention, I, I neglected to mention, for the regions portion, that we did, we did give students flexibility with regard to that score being on their region, on their transcript or not. So even for students that took that exam, and that, that was for eighth grade students and also for all of the degree students, if they did well on the exam and they thought it would help them, they could put it on their transcript and not make it off for the E, which was exempt. Um, so they didn't have to put it on their transcript. So they had that flexibility. Um, here you can see the percentage of total AP students with a score of three plus. I mean, you know, remember, as Dr. Ackerman said, um, the rules in 2021 with regard to being able to opt out were a little bit different than in previous years. You can see that data, and then you have the overall number of exams as well as the average score for the different courses. So I have some really class of 2021 data. I also include some of the 2020 data. You can see the National Merit Commended Students, and finalists etc. 98% of the class, which is pretty consistent in previous years, went on to higher education. Um, and then you can see the um, ACT and SAT scores over the last few years. So I, can, I conclude, as I have for the last several years, with just a list of, list of anticip anticipated matriculation with regard to colleges and the uh, students reported to us that they were going to attend last year in uh, 2021. Uh, certainly a really nice list of, of colleges and students after that. So uh, that's, the, that's the data report that I have for you this evening. And then, like I said, I'll bring the of New York State data for three through eight months is uh, at least for me. Any, any questions for Adam? It's a hard presentation. Oh, here. Yeah, there's it's so many different variables over the past two years in, in, in our testing program. Um, even in SAT administration, we did our best to offer the SAT as many times as practical based on 
health concerns that you're experiencing at the time, I, even if you remember how to cancel one. So it's like, I, I feel like um, our data has been consistent, even in the face of great difficulty. Um, while we can't present our ELA and math data to you right now, we all know the challenges associated with that administration last year and the choices that were made by the New York State Health um, Education Department to use recycled tests. So even if we were presenting that to you tonight, I'm less, in our, I'm less comfortable with that, using that data to drive decisions than I am with our maps assessments, which is what we're relying heavily on this year. So Christine, it just seems to me that we really have to rely on next year's scores to really assess how our students are doing. Um, based on, you know, here we're comparing apples to oranges a little bit, and so it's a little challenging, but, I, you know, I am concerned nevertheless that we are seeing some downturns, especially in algebra. How would you assess this going forward with next year's results? So I would, how, how would you approach yeah, those I, challenges next year? Because that will be a more representative sample. I So I, oh, we're going to answer that in two parts. So I'm going to start with the first part, where we have a, a really strong handle on our students and their performance in grades 1 through 8 because of the math assessment, which is that was administered last year, was administered the previous year, and will be administered this year. And we're in the process of doing the first grade. Done three times over the course of the year, and it really helps us plan individualized instruction and make adjustments for, for our group instructional practices. But in terms of algebra, we've made significant shifts in the way that we're supporting that program. And I just maybe um, share some of the strategies that we've been using to help our, um, our eighth grade teachers in particular uh, address some of the instructional differences that they need to account for now that it's not, for lack of a better term, an honors program. Yeah, so we, we did extensive um, curriculum rating and professional development over the summer. We spent two full weeks um, with our, with our uh, middle school math teachers as well as teachers that support those programs, special education and, and also our speech teachers in the middle school. Um, and we pulled in a um, math, math expert, Karen Foreman, a regional math teacher, former high school teacher, middle school teacher, and department chair to be a kind of an outside expert that we used as a facilitator and much of the professional development as well as our own director of Technology and Mathematics, Josh Fogelbach. Um, and we, we um, redesigned the curriculum for that course so it's leveled and differentiated for the students. Um, they're experiencing homework that has three different sections to it, and students pick two of the sections. So there's like a skill building section, a core section, and then an enrichment section. Students can do all three if they want to start the skill building section and then do the core and then do the enrichment, or students, all students do two sections of it. So there's been some purposeful redesign with regard to how students engage in that content so it's more differentiated and then we can be into the, the students in eighth grade regardless of how they enter that course. Um, and what it, what it does, it's challenging for us to measure now, is it gives all students the opportunity to reach terminal courses in high school that many students have not had the opportunity to reach had they not taken that algebra course in eighth grade. Um, so that, like that, that the opportunities or the doors that that opens, it's hard to measure, but we've heard over and over from colleges that the terminal math class matters. And, and so to have that extra year of walking in middle school, even if the student finds it really challenging and, and struggles through it, it does open up opportunity in, in, you know, as juniors and seniors to take those challenging upper level math classes prior to college. Right, and I'd, I'd like to remind uh, the community that we have open, have had open enrollment for algebra. And parents could certainly have overrided overrode the recommendation, but parents had to um, have, had to be active and engage in that process with the administration. And so if you had a parent that chose not to do that, then you were at a disadvantage. So this is one of our ways of being more equitable in our district. And I, I, I think it's in line with our strategic plan, and um, I look forward to sharing with the board and the community of progress over the course of the year, and I know it'll be a part of our middle school presentations to the Board of Education um, during the context of our, our meetings. And we'll share with you our progress at the end of the school year when we can analyze the results on the outdoor assessment. 
And we know that this is a harder I know this was a harder presentation in terms of compiling the data to see how our kids were doing, but I, I think that the choices that you all made last year in terms of making tests as optional as possible um, was really commendable in terms of how our students were doing in, in ways that are not academic and, and really making the school year in its bizarre form as sort of comfortable and, and accessible and manageable for our students as possible. So even though we can make the data presentation harder, I think that it, it was absolutely the right choice for, for the kids. And you know, I guess what, what is or is not administered this year was sort of the main excuse me. I really wanted, like, what is reasonable? Is it reasonable in the middle of a pandemic to have, to, to require that students take an AP exam? No, that wasn't, re that wasn't a reasonable decision. Could that have potentially impacted our school? Absolutely. But, I mean, at, at some point, you have to sit back and say, what is in the best interest of, the, of, the, of our students, given the conditions in which we're, we're in right now? So, um, hopefully, because we, we're in a much better space, and if, if things continue on the current path that we're in, we'll be able to have our students engage in our assessments that are typical and have that information um, to be able to, to plan forward in the ways that we have in the past. It just wasn't, just wasn't practical or possible. Yeah, I, I have a question, and, and uh, I agree with what you were saying, Hillary, as well, in terms of what's reasonable under these circumstances. But I, I know it has been um, brought up in previous years about the requirement to take the AP exam at the end of an AP class. So was that a, a temporary adjustment or do you see that moving forward? And I don't know, it's interesting to me because it fits into our whole picture of you know, the social emotional um, aspect of our students right. and especially some of them that get to senior year, which is a very crushing year and they may, you know, be taking a lot of AP courses, and by the time those AP exams are given, they're already accepted to college, etc. They, they've made some decisions. Um, but it's also interesting to note that, and we've heard this as well, we heard this recently at our retreat about, about colleges really focusing on the students challenging themselves, and it's more important that they take the class and see how they do in the class than, than what that one assessment tells them. Um, so I don't know what your decisions are moving forward. I know that's always been a requirement that you must take it to get credit for the course. So I don't know if that's a that's yeah. sort of up for discussion as to moving forward. So um, I think in my second year here, we opened enrollment for AP classes as long as students have the prerequisite course, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, in, in the conversations about requiring the AP exams, uh, and I'm not saying that might not shift moving into the future, but faculty felt that was a critical component of, um, of, of their course for students. Right. And so um, last year, we made that adjustment out of necessity. Mm -hmm. This year, the expectation of students will be taking the AP exam if they are enrolled in the corresponding course. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean conversations in the future can't, can't, um, can't happen around that requirement. Mm -hmm. I just know at this moment, it is, it is currently required based on our traditional practices. Right, and then certainly that's feedback we can bring to the high school administration to have conversations with the faculty who would absolutely need to be a part of that decision. Right, and, and there's also, there, there's a financial aspect to that as well. Um, you know, these exams are, are not inexpensive to take, and some colleges are very specific with but if you get a good score, they don't take it. So I know there are some students for financial reasons who don't want to pay out the money for all of those APs. So I just, uh, I'm just wondering if that's going to be in the mix moving forward. I completely get it that they want kids to have an assessment at the end of that class. Um, so I'm assuming that it may get revisited down the road. But it can also do two um, very desirable things at the same time. It can allow students to challenge themselves while at the same time reducing stress. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, I, and I, so you know, that's yeah. always been one of right. our goals. Exactly. And we, we have to remember why we worked so hard to keep the schools open all year last year. And that was because we have the mental health of our students at the forefront of our priorities. So uh, as we get back to more normal times, I, I do want to keep that, that focus on our students' mental health and 
that stressor because we our students do excel academically. So we want to take care of, of, of the whole child. So um, I, I hear um, in your comments some of the benefits associated with having the AP exam be potentially optional. There's another piece of this conversation though that um, that would, what that needs to be flushed out is ensuring that students approach those courses with the seriousness at which they can. Absolutely. Right? So that, that, that is the, that's the conversation right. that um, needs to occur, which can occur at the high school level um, in, in talking about this moving forward. Right. So, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there's no other questions for Adam, we'll transition to our audit report. This will take us one second. So, Alan, are you going to join us up here? And then, um, Andrew, if you can introduce Alan to the community, and then um, David will place your PowerPoint on the presentation, and, and then Alan will bring over the clip. Alan Say is our partner. Our external audit firm. Um, each year, the Connor Davies comes in and uh, reviews the district's financial uh, position, our financial records, and finishes our external audit report. And I want to thank Alan for his time helping me up to speak uh, on the district finances, but also helping us um, close the books during a period of transition of business office, which is no small task that happens. Um, Kathy Winter, who's prepared to talk to you here, did a great job of getting us through this process. Very good. Okay, as Andrew mentioned, I'm going to give you a summary of the results from the June 30th, 2021 election. Okay, so the stages of the audit are as follows. In June 9th and 10th, we did preliminary field work where we tested, we tested controls. We catch the feet, catch the first rooms, pay off. The actual field work was held the week of July 26, and then we had another audit committee, which is a required meeting on September 21st, and tonight we're going over the summary of the audit. Okay, contained within the audit reports a summary of communication, a summary of the financial statements, the management letter, which is the communication of the internal control matters to those charged with governance, and then some other comments. Okay. Included in the summary of communications, these are some of the auditor's responsibility under the standards. One is to form an opinion based on our audit. Another is to obtain reasonable rather than absolute assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. Maintain professional skepticism. Conduct the audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States, known as U.S. GAS. And during the audit, there were no material errors, no fraudulent financial reporting, and misappropriation of assets were noted. And there were no instances or suspicions or allegations of fraud. Some of management's responsibilities is to establish and maintain effective internal controls. As I mentioned, there were no material weaknesses. To comply with all the laws, regulations, grants, and contracts. And to have adequate judgment and accounting estimates, which they would deem to be reasonable. And there were no significant audit adjustments. In addition, there were no disagreements with management. There were no unresolved difficulties in the audit, no consultation by management with other accountants, and PKF of Honey Davies is independent with respect to the school district in accordance with relevant professional standards. And there were no irregularities or illegal acts. Okay, in the management letter, there were three comments. One had to do with the audit readiness, the fixed assets, also called the capital assets, the information that we received initially was not in agreement with the internal records or to the prior year's audit. Uh, there was some back and forth. It was eventually resolved, but it didn't cause a slight delight. 
Um, the other comment had to do with the timeliness of cash deposits. New York State requires that all deposits may be made within 72 hours of receipt. There were several deposits within the extra classroom activities fund that were not made within that time period. And lastly, there were four capital projects that had no activity in the current year. Now these comments are basically control deficiencies as opposed to a material weakness or a significant deficiency, meaning that this is, for the most part, information for the board to address. I know that Andrew had prepared a response to these three comments. Okay, now I don't know if anybody can see this, but this is the general fund schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, both budget and actual. So, of course, it is rather small up there. I think everybody should have a copy. I will just go through some of the highlights. On the revenue side, the original budget was 124694000 The final budget was approximately the same, and the actual results came in at 124472000 That total is almost $2 million, $1.8 billion greater than in the prior year. A large portion of that came from the tax levies, Plus, he did stay within the cap. Um, in addition, the federal rate was up slightly because he received two CARES grants, and that's reported in the other area. On the expenditure side, the original budget was 130 million 314. That was basically remained the same, 130 million 252, and the actual candidate 125 million 962,000. That's up 5.5 million from the prior year. And a good portion of the expenditures that showed an increase were directly related to COVID from the prior year. Um, the general government support was up by 2.2 million. And that was because certain expenditures within the capital projects fund were reclassified into the general fund. Instruction was up minimally 528,000. Pupil transportation was up because, again, that's directly related to COVID from the prior year. And the employee benefits showed an increase of 1.2 billion. And that was related to the increase in the employee retirement system, the teacher's retirement system, and the health benefits. The debt service expenditures remained comparable to the prior year. So the excess of deficiency for deficiency of revenues over expenditures. In the actual column, the fifth number up was about 1.5 million. And then you had other financing uses, which was the transfer out to the special aid fund, which was increased from the original budget, because basically what you did was you eliminated and wrote off some old prior receivables from the state that were uncollectible. 15, 2015, 16, 17, 18, and some from 1920. And you transferred an additional 750,000 into the capital projects fund. So the net change in fund balance, if you look at the original budget column, you see the bracketed 5,870,000. When you put together the 2021 budget, you anticipated utilizing 5.8 million of fund balance to balance the budget. You increase that number during the year to 7.1 million, but in actuality, you only used 3,184,000, thereby generating an overall positive budgetary variance of almost 4 million, 3,915,000. So if you take the net change in fund balance, the shortfall of 3.2 million, Add it to your fund balance at the beginning of the year of 22,911. You ended the year with a total fund balance of 19,727,000. Okay, this is the general fund balance sheet. I basically just want to focus on the middle of the page going down. It's the fund balance. The assets and the liabilities had minor fluctuations. 
So in your fund balance, you had non-spendable fund balance, which are the prepaid expenditures, of $265,000. Then you have total reserves or restricted fund balance of $8,784,000. You have one for tax tertiary claims, which was down 100000 due to the calculation. The employee benefit accrued liability, which is compensated absences, that's the time off that the employees earn. That was down about 500000 Some of those funds were utilized during the year. The employee's retirement system was about comparable to the prior year. There was some interest allocated, and that's a million four seventy one. The future capital projects, you use six hundred and fifty thousand of that to fund certain capital projects during the year. And then the other is about a million five twenty seven. So the total reserves are eight million seven hundred and eighty four thousand. In the assigned fund balance, you have encumbrances. Two million one hundred fifty-nine thousand, which are basically purchase orders which were issued prior to June thirtieth, for which you hadn't received the goods or services as of June thirtieth. That two million one hundred fifty-nine thousand will be rolled into your twenty-one twenty-two original budget, and then you are taking three million five hundred forty-two thousand out of the unsigned fund balance at the end of twenty twenty-one and using that to balance the 21-22 budget. That number is the same number that was appropriated in the end of June 30, 2020. So you ended the year with an unassigned fund balance of almost $5 million, $4,976,000, and that's equal to 3.81% 3 of the 21-22 budget. And the New York State statutory limit for the unassigned fund balance is 4%, so you're below the 4% limit. Um, Ellen, I just want to mention something on the restricted fund balance, because that's a high number, you know, 8.7 million. So I just want to clarify, just so people know that we, you know, we're restricted in what we do put um, into, that, into those categories based on reasonable estimates of, of future expenses. Right. For example, the tax tertiary of 2.7 million cannot exceed the outstanding claims that exist at this point in time based upon the payment. Usually a claim is submitted and the payout is anywhere from 30 to 35 to 40 percent. So your total claims outstanding or that are pending is usually calculated using those percentages and that's the limit you can have in that reserve. The employee benefit accrued liability cannot exceed what's outstanding for the compensated absences that have actually been earned by the employees as of June 30th. The employee's retirement system does not have a limit, but generally the state controller likes the amount to be within three years or three years worth of expenditures, so you're within that limit. The future capital projects was established by the voters and you're certainly within that limit. And then the various other reserves are, some of them do have statutory limits, but you're not in excess of any of those. So all your reserves are within the required limits. Okay, so just to summarize, we issued an unmodified opinion, also known as a clean opinion. It's the best opinion you can receive. There were no material weaknesses noted during the audit. The school district's rating is AAA for Moody's. And again, you appropriated almost $3.5 million to balance the 21-22 budget. In addition, the district implemented GASB, Government Accountant Standards Board Statement Number 84, which basically took your agency fund, which only, which was a fund that basically had payroll withholdings and your extra classroom activity fund deposits in that fund, and we removed that fund, the as we removed that fund, and those funds, are now, those activities are now either in the general fund or the special purpose fund. So the agency fund is gone, and the new fund is called a custodial fund, but you have no activity in that fund, so it does not appear in the current year financial 
financial statements. So overall, the implementation of that statement 84 was not a major change for the district. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, may I just, uh, just for clarification purposes, the, the board is also have, has membership in the audit committee. So this is our second time um, experiencing this presentation from Alan. Um, so I just want to make that clarification for the community. We do have an audit committee that meets and has community members who are part of it, as well as Kathy and Andrew. Um, so this isn't our first time seeing this information. And we've already had uh, a chance to interact around uh, our budget with Alan. So with that, with that said, I didn't know if anyone had any additional questions for Alan tonight based on what he's presented. I want to thank you very much for, for all of the support. For, um, I'd also, I'd like to thank Kathy in the audience, our treasurer, and Andrew. It's hard to come in. Andrew came in in, in the middle of uh, trying to close out the school year and um, prepare the audit for the Board of Education, and that, that is not easy to do. So thank, thank you to both of you um, for supporting this, this process. And uh, Alan, thank you for joining us. And thank you to Warren, who I now can't see because they're excited, <laughs> but for heading the audit committee uh, and, and, and taking the time to, to chair those meetings. There you are. Good. Good. All right, thank you. Don't take us, don't put, yeah, leave that there. <laughs> okay, and that's the end of um, the superintendent's report and all of our presentations. Uh, Christine, do we have to vote to approve to uh, accept the? Uh, is that that's in the agenda, right? Yeah, we have a surprise. It's in the consent agenda. It's in the consent agenda. Should we do that right now? We usually do. Can we take that? I think we need to allow the public to comment on it before we vote on it. Oh right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. So um, that actually brings us. To our committee report, thank you to Steve and to Adam for the presentations and all the information. And obviously, the information that's coming in this year is always a little bit dependent on the fact that last year was COVID year. But um, we appreciate the updates and, and knowing what's going on in the district and, and how our kids are performing. And I thought the math data was particularly interesting because that that is the most controllable data points that we have, and that was great data, okay. Thank goodness we put them in place for the strategic planning process. Yeah, so thank you, and I think that would probably through this year also continue to be our most useful data point. Um, so that brings us to committee reports. Uh, does anybody have anything to report? I'll just note quickly that the policy committee meeting that was originally scheduled for tomorrow has been postponed a week and is scheduled for the, I believe it's the 7th, it's not the 3rd, but, um, and that's, that's all I have to report. Does anybody else have any communications? We met on, I believe it was Thursday the 23rd. Um, Vicki and I uh, met with Christine. Um, we are also going to be continuing our communications advisory committee, and I know we reached out to some members from the community that we had with us last year, and they'll stay on. We found it very beneficial to get community input on ways that we can better um, engage with the community and get our messages across and get feedback from them as well. Uh, but in terms of our meeting, I think we, we just we discussed a couple of things and what some goals were for the year. Um, one of the things we did discuss, which I think some people will see, is that we've talked about um, putting some, you know, considering putting a hub on our website uh, for, for certain notices, information like we do with COVID notifications or we do things with form-based code or, or things that's sort of like easy access and easy to find notices that get sent out. We understand everybody gets a lot of emails, especially if you have multiple children in multiple schools, but we also want our community members to be able to access our information in a really uh, easy fashion. So we've talked about that and we've talked about ways to connect with uh, community members that don't have children in the schools anymore to let them know what we're doing all the exciting stuff that's going on. And um, maybe I don't know if you want to add like things that we had discussed in terms of some, some goals for this year, Christine as well. Not that I have. Um, I think that 
I think that just about does it. I, I think that it would be really useful for us to think of ways to reach out to different stakeholder groups who don't normally interact with the school district. I know that you know, while senior communities might, might enjoy coming to theater and concert performances at the school district, but that's going to be more from post-COVID days. But right. Also, kind of everyone keeps asking us for an alumni database. We don't have one. So what are you talking about? Yeah. Is there a way for us to create um, an opportunity to reach out to our alumni for different reasons um, in some kind of systematic way? So we're going to talk about that more. Well. Does that sound like really? Does that sound like really? Good and, and interesting ideas, and I'm excited to hear. There are more, particularly about the hub. I think, you know, as you said, Jane, we're all so sort of inundated with emails that just knowing we could go somewhere and find something. Right. There's always there's always uh, new ways and better ways to present our information and to make it as uh, those websites as facile as possible. So we're we're going to work on. Anything else for the Great, so that brings us to our public comment period. So we welcome public comments, and in respect for each other's time, we ask that you limit your comments please to three minutes. Board members may be contacted via email or phone. After the public comment period has been completed, the board members may have a discussion amongst themselves regarding the comments presented. So if you'd like to make a public comment, please come down to one of the microphones and state your uh, name and address and your comment. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Hilton Brand. Uh, I live on Prospect Drive in Chappaqua. I'm a 23 year resident of Chappaqua and a parent of two Greeley graduates and a current Greeley junior. I just want to briefly comment on the DGIS and uh, form based code currently being considered by the town board. This process is really a fantastic exercise in, in civics and good government. Specifically, the distinction between policy and process. I believe this policy matter form-based code is totally inappropriate for a community like Newcastle, where residents are engaged, involved, and want to say how the community achieves appropriate development. Indeed, the town's own consultant noted in the working group in 2019, the form-based code is not generally appropriate in towns where there's high community engagement. Nevertheless, we're a representative democracy, not an opinion democracy. As the current town board majority has counted upon repeatedly, there's no requirement for expansive community outreach and no ability to have a referendum. An interested agency basically learn what they need to know when they need to know it. So if the planning board, the library board, the fire department, and the school board are unsatisfied, well, that's just the way it goes. Up until last summer, the town board was in fact satisfied to rely on public hearing notices and formal procedures. And in the best of times, i.e. not during the global pandemic, most residents just don't have the bandwidth to track. Until the grassroots opposition began to build and resident voices were heard loud and clear, there was essentially next to no community outreach. So process is key, key to build consensus, key to ensure acceptance, key to maintain the public's trust. The fact that the school board, as stewards of the crown jewel of Newcastle, are not satisfied as, as of today, at this late date, to accept the FGEIS as adequate and complete is simply shocking. It should cause all residents to feel betrayed. Not necessarily by the policy, as ill-advised as, Ill as it may be. That can be debated, ideally over time, and with full information and transparency. But equally critically, by the process. Along those lines, I just want to quote from the school board council's letter earlier today. The school board objects to the extremely curtailed timetable given the interest of agencies to review of the FGEIS. This timetable was not intended to and did not allow time for the school district to provide detailed input on the FGEIS. There's a further elaboration of what those uh, deficiencies are. So as a 23-year resident, I just want to thank you. In the midst of the global pandemic, where all of our lives were turned upside down, and where students, faculty, staff, administrators, and school board have been taxed in ways that were previously unimaginable, unimaginable. You all have collectively navigated uncharted waters doing it. It is beyond belief that you then had to wrestle with a dramatic and transformational zoning and development project that will place unknown but entirely foreseeable strains on our schools, 
and exacerbate the hidden tax burden for residents already there. Yet, that you've been kept in the dark and essentially disregarded throughout this process is put mildly unfortunate. P.S. Five more seconds. As you are concluding your board meeting tonight, the town board announced that it's postponed tomorrow's meeting to October 5th to give the board more time to consider your comments and concerns. So double thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peggy McKeadow. I am the president of the Chakrabha PTA, and I just wanted to um, give you guys a little information and to tell you what we're up to. Um, first of all, we had an amazing event on Saturday. Our um, Diversity, Race, and Belonging Committee held a family welcome back event, and thank you to Dr. Ackerman, to um, Adam Pease, and maybe Tip for attending. We also had principals, Andrew Priscilla, and Carol Bartlett, and others. We had 300 registrants for the event, and it was a great turnout and a lot of new families. And so I really appreciate on a weekend you all taking time to spend a, an afternoon, a sunny afternoon with us um, and with our families. Um, then I want to let you know that the Chappaqua PTA fall meeting is Monday, October 4th. It's going to be at the Greeley Tent. And we welcome everyone to join the PTA and attend. Registration is required. And our guest speaker is Wajahat Ali. He's an author, a speaker, a parent. He has a um, TED talk that's called The Case for Having Children. And he has a message of unity for our entire community. So I'm hoping that you all will consider coming. Um, we have our principal coffees coming up, and so I'm very excited that our, we're working and making events that parents can be at least on our campuses, outside, and meeting um, their principals in, in real life. And our school chairs have really been working hard to try to do as much as they can uh, for our families, and everyone has been so, so helpful. Um, Thank you to Dr. Ackman and all her team for making testing available for all students. I know that there are families who, who have concerns and maybe they haven't availed themselves of it yet, but I really feel it helps uh, build their confidence about how you're dealing with everything. And, um, I know it's always, uh, it's always everyone pitching in in all unusual ways during these COVID times, but it doesn't go unnoticed. Um, and, uh, and lastly, uh, thank you for your additional time and um, really advocating for the school district and for all of our students in helping the town think through its uh, big decisions that has come up. I know that it's a lot of reading. I've tried to <laughs> go through the pages myself. So um, all of you as, uh, as volunteers, um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, going out of your way. Are there any additional public comments? If not, then we're going to move on with just a brief discussion. Sure, absolutely. So I appreciate that um, one of our residents has shared with us that the meeting originally scheduled for tomorrow has been moved, but the district has not been notified of that by the town, so. Uh, we see we can't hear you very well. I just I want to I'm sharing with you is in public comment tonight, it was mentioned that the meeting that was scheduled tomorrow night on form base code um, BDIS was rescheduled based on our uh, correspondence submitted today, but we have not been notified of that officially. So I just I just want to say that publicly. There's, I have my um, I have my uh, email open right now. I haven't received any notification of that that has happened. So that may very well be the case, but I, uh, I, I would just note that um, I did get a notice of town notice because I signed up for Pixel Alerts. I came to my personal email but did not receive anything to a board email or anything in response to the board email address. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, I just I just want to make that noted. Well, we would have shared that ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I appreciate the commenters today, and thank you, Peggy, for reminding everyone that we are volunteers, so people don't actually know that. So. Yeah. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Peggy. I heard the event on Saturday it was wonderful. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, that brings us to approvals and ratification. Um, can I have a motion, please, for items? 3.1 and 3.2, which are accepting the minutes of the September 14th and September 23rd board meetings, respectively. Um, so moved. I'll second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. I recommend 4.1 instruction as presented. I move that we accept uh, 4.1 as presented. Second. Any questions? David, please say aye. Aye. I recommend 4.2 non instructional as presented. Uh, I will move 4.2 non instructional. I'll second 4.2. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that brings us to our consent agenda. The use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting in a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the Board which is discussed individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate, and that item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all Board members to be heard on any issue. Um, does anybody at this point want to remove anything from the consent agenda. Obviously, we can still discuss anything on the consent agenda, but does anybody want to remove anything from the consent agenda? No? Okay. Um, then can I have a motion, please, to move the consent agenda, which is items 5.1 through 5.16, um, including CSE summaries, the audit committee recommendations, uh, accepting the external audit report, um, the gifts that, that Adam mentioned, um, supplemental agreements, uh, and a number of other routine matters. Okay, I will move the consent agenda. I will second. Any questions or discussion? I, I, I just want to reiterate our thanks to um, Newcastle United for Youth and to CFR for their gift. Very good. Okay. And uh, uh, sorry, I had a question. Go ahead, Warren. Warren, you go first. Go ahead, Warren. I'm getting a delay here. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Andrew Lenny uh, for stepping in as our new assistant superintendent for business and taking on the uh, audit. And I was in the process just when we got here, but it's, it's a big job as it is. And uh, just to get the speed so quickly and for Kathy helping him and for all the administration and for um, O'Connor Davies, who are always doing a great job for us. So thank you very much. Um, I just had a question about the uh, bids for the roof on West Orchard. I know that's been a repair that's been in the works for a while. Um, so do we anticipate that we will get some? Um, better bids or, or maybe they were like not conforming or issues with what was submitted. So I just had a quick question about that, if there was any update on that. The, the single, single largest issue is that it, there's more repairs to be done than the funds available at the moment. So what we're going to do is just come on down to connect myself and look at the scope of that work and identify the spaces that are the most in need of repair. Okay. We want to get again to, to address those as a priority. Um, we'll have to come back and look at other space on that. And I think you talked, I had Joe explain that to us before that this can be fixed in stages, so we might have to break this job off, is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. We'll absolutely have to do that, yes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions or concerns? All in favor of the consent agenda? Yes. Aye. Okay, that brings us to item 6.1. Um, under 6, we are acknowledging contracts 
previously approved by the superintendent uh, per board policy securely by purchasing bidding. So I will move that we acknowledge the following the contract for an agreement with services under 6.1. I'll move item 6.1. I'll second. Any questions, Mr. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, facilities. Uh, can I have a motion, please, for 7.1, which is uh, acknowledgement of a change order for the STEAM Center at really previously approved by the superintendent? Oh, we got money back. Yes, that's why it's large, but it's under that section. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to move the credit? <laughs> I'll move. 7.1. I'll second. Any questions, concerns? You like credit. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Items 8.1 and 8.2, can I have a motion to take them together? It's acknowledging receipt of the claims auditor report for August 2021 and receipt of the treasurer's report also for August 2021. Okay, I will move items 8.1 and 8.2, acknowledging receipt of the financial. I'll second. Questions and concerns? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Bye. Great, that brings us to notice of future meetings. Our next meeting is Wednesday, October 13th at 7.30. Um, back here, we will have the Warren Brook Elementary School presentation. That's always fun. We love having the students come in. And following that, uh, the second meeting in October on the 27th, we will have the West Orchard Elementary School presentation also back here in the auditorium. Um, can I please have a motion? Adjourn at 9.18 p.m. I move to adjourn at uh, 9.18 or 6.18 by <laughs> <laughs> I will second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.